My name is Sam Goldwasser. I've been involved in uh, electronics since I was around age 10. I uh, went to MIT for uh, computer design with zeros and ones, but thought that was a little limiting. So I became interested in lasers and other stuff related to uh, light waves. So now I'm kind of the uh, considered as a expert in this stuff, although that that's kind of uh, not really accurate, but at least I give the presentation as, as one. And I'm gonna give this presentation the PowerPoint. And then after that, I'll walk down to the, my quote lab and show a, 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 a rather a, a version of the interferometer for the sort of a lab version that will show what it does. So what we're talking about is really measurement displacement. But first, let's, how do I do this? How do I change the slide? Okay. One of the largest applications of uh, displacement yeah. interferometry. Bigger. Good. I see. Is in the manufacture of uh, semiconductor wafers. Every microchip in the universe for the last several decades has used a laser interferometer for positioning the stage in, what, in the so-called wafer stepper. This diagram is from a research, uh, research gate, but the, it gives you the general idea. There's a laser, there are a couple interferometers, and that's used to position the, the stage which holds the wafer. This has to be done to nanometer precision. It also has to be done very quickly. So a typical way, stepper, as I understand it, spends less than a second on each step, and it has to do with dozens or hundreds to expose a wafer. So the general inter idea of the homodyne interferometer displaced measuring system is there's a, there's a laser. This shows a single frequency laser. We, we will not be using that, but we don't, it's not absolutely necessary. There's the interferometer. There's the moving tool, target, re reflector. And there's uh, optical uh, detection of the, uh, the signal and then signal processing. Now, keep in mind, we're talking about displacement. We're, this is not a range finder. It has to be zero to a reference. The challenge is uh, design is just one of the very many possible variations on this scheme. The 35, 30, 633 nanometer wavelength of the Heaney laser is uh, approximately 100th by the width of a human hair. And the achievable resolution with, with intelligent processing can be orders of magnitude better than that. Even the unstabilized laser used in the challenge, which as has been noted, you need to not drop it because it will break. Uh, the accuracy of the wavelength changes by less than two parts per million. But the environmental conditions are much more significant. For example, one change of one degree centigrade is a change of one part per million. 2.5 millimeters of mercury is uh, one part per million also. So if strictly speaking, we should be keeping track of that, but we're going to ignore those minor details. Now, if you go to a textbook and look up Nicholson interferometer, which is what we're discussing here, you'll get a diagram, something like this. A laser, a beam splitter, two mirrors, and some sort of detector. The detector will often be just a white screen, and what you'll get are fringe patterns. In, for our purposes, a detector is a one or two photodiodes that will provide signals that we can process and interpret. This goes way back, mid 1880s. That's way before the laser had even anybody even conceived of a laser. But it also works with, at least for short, for small differences in the spacing of these mirrors for uh, normal light. And in particular, probably at that time for, from gas discharge tubes, which generate relatively narrow uh, wavelengths of, uh, of light. But with the basic Nicholson interferometer, alignment is extremely critical. The back reflections, when aligned correctly, go back right to the laser, which can destabilize it. And that re backwards reflected beam also represents a 50% waste of power. 
So the first improvement where this, where this shows just attempting to do that by just rearranging the mirrors doesn't work. Just moving, angling the, uh, the up and the top and bottom mirrors doesn't, does basically nothing. Angling M2, the reflected, the first reflected mirror kind of messes things up and you don't get a single spot as we want. You get a distributed fringe pattern, which can be useful, but that's not what we're interested in here. So the first improvement is to replace the simple mirrors with what are called cube corners or retro reflectors or trihedral prisms that are all the same thing or colloquially called corner cube, but that kind of doesn't make any sense. So I just think of them as a, as a cute, as corner of a cube cut off and used as a, an optical reflector. Now the, the turn beams, the reflected beams do not come back into the laser. They're offset by some arbitrary amount. Uh, but there's still a lot, still a waste of power in the left, the, the return beam going through the beam splitter. So the next improvement is going to be to do use polarized light and a polarizing beam splitter. Now we've all, or, or we already seen a description of this. The laser itself produces linearly polarized light at 45 degrees. This this animation is actually at zero or 90 degrees. And we'll also find that circularly polarized light is important as, as noted in the previous uh, talk. So the next improvement is we replace the simple beam splitter with a polarizing beam splitter. It's normally a cube. The cube is convenient because the, the reflecting surface is fully protected and it's easier to handle and, and mount, but it could be, there are such things as plate beam splitters which do the same thing. Now this configuration already is an interferometer that's as a useful setup. It's called a linear interferometer for un, actually unknown reasons, although it's probably because the cube and the remote reflector are in line, but I've never found a good explanation. So here it is, there's a this photograph of a uh, one that costs about $3,000, although it's made of $100 optics, but HP, Agilent, Keysight gets a lot of money for these things. So that's the, that, that's actually would be the, the ARM1 and cube, PBS cube would be actually contained in that, that stainless steel metal block. The, the sensitivity or the resolution of the linear interferometer is 316 nanometers using the ED, Heaney laser. And I, I just, just as I dig digression, the Heaney laser is unique. It's what, it was the second laser, I believe, that was ever invented. But some, uh, let's see, 40, 70, 60, 60 some years later, it's still the absolute best laser for this, this the use in, in a metrology interferometer because the optical frequency corresponding to wavelength is accurate to many, many, many orders of magnitude. And that's not true of most other lasers. In fact, there is no existing replacement for the Heaney laser that would do the same, the job as well uh, for an affordable price and almost at any price. A laser pointer just won't do it. So wave plates are, are used for polar, used to, to change the characteristics of polarized light. Normal optics are isotropic, a, a mirror or a, lens ideally treats light regardless of its polarization. Wave plates are birefringent. They have what are known as slow and fast optical axes, which means the speed of light differs depending on the polarization orientation. <clears throat> the difference in propagation between the slow and fast axis results in a phase shift measured in a fraction of wavelengths of light. The type that is most relevant here, the quarter wave plate has a delay of one quarter wavelength at 633 nanometers or about 158 nanometers. Q quarter wave plates are used in two places here. In some interferometer inter configurations like the one you will be using, they re redirect return beams from the mirrors or retro reflectors through the PBS so that they take a different optical path. As part of the quadric decoder, they also create the required phase shift between the two signals, the sine, cosine, or A and B signals. 
And the circular polarizer, which was described before, is simply a linear polarizer oriented at 45 degrees, followed by a quarter wave plate oriented at zero degrees. These are also used in photography. You can probably uh, Google them though, but you, anybody here who's a photographer probably has used a circular polarizer on their camera. This one, this configuration I'm going to show you later in the flesh or in the optics. It's the so-called high, high stability plane mirror interferometer. And it's probably the most common configuration used in uh, high precision applications. The configuration you're using is very similar, but instead of mirrors, it uses the Q corners. And uh, therefore the, uh, the quarter wave plates redirect the beam from traveling in the left hand, left hand direction straight through the PBS to being reflected down to the detector. And that was simply done as a convenience uh, in the setting up the mechanical arrangement. It doesn't change the set. It doesn't change the resolution. While the uh, high high stability plane mirror interferometer doubles the resolution because the the light takes two two passes through all the optics be, because of the quarter wave plates redirecting the beams. So you can figure it. It's kind of shown in the diagram, but you can trace them yourself. Figure out how it works. Now, what's this? All this these signals in order to the basic Nicholson interferometer rather generates a sing would generate a single signal. That's a, that's basically a measure of the fring fringe generated by the interference of the two uh, light light waves coming from the opposite the, the two arms of the interferometer. But a single signal is not useful for determining direction. So what's used is something called quadrature coding, and this is common in the rotary or linear encoders, and all kinds of other applications. Here, we need to generate the uh, two signals by taking the light returned by the interferometer, shifting part of it by 90 degrees, so on, and, and applying that to a, a separate photo detector. With quadrature coding, only a single bit can change at any given time. And uh, effect, essentially, a large up-down counter keeps track of the total value. With the sign, with the original signals, the resolution is a fraction of the period, which is dependent on the interferometer. For the analog signals, the interpolation, using interpolation before or after digitizing, can extend the resolution down below one nanometer. However, if they're just threshold, as they would be in a typical encoder, then the resolution is limited to basically one quarter of the period. And there are various schemes for shifting these uh, the phases. These these are all very simple schemes. If you if you Google quadrature decoder, you'll get all kinds of really hairy approaches that were probably used for very special research projects, but are not exactly uh, necessary for anything that is done here. So that's the end of the uh, presentation. Now we're going to go down to my uh, sausage factory lab and see one in action. So it'll be a couple minutes. We can talk amongst ourselves in the interim. A big chunk of it is in this red book that the Zygo guys helped this guy write. Uh, the Zygo book. So how do I have to unshare the screen somehow? Oh, uh, wait, hold on. Be right back. Hey, Sam, uh, someone is saying that it would be nice if you point to whatever you're talking about. Is that something you can do? Yeah, yeah, I just, I just have to I'm go back. A little late for that. Okay. Well, no, not on this, on the, uh, on the uh, PowerPoint, but on the, on the, on the, uh, actual device, but I, it'll be two minutes. I have to go back up and un, unless you can unshare my screen. Can you unshare uh, my screen? I'm going to try that. All right, let me see. 
you got to kick Sam off. Otherwise, it's just both screens at the same time. Well, you can you can kick you can kick me off of the uh, version that has a shared screen, or I can just go on share it. Just oh, hey. okay. All right. So you need to. I'm going to. Uh, I'm going to enable stop my camera. There. there it is. So uh, how do I enable the camera? Hey, can you, uh, all right, yeah, to, uh, yeah, yeah, that's you. Uh, there it is. Okay, Wait. here we go. So I don't know how the best way to do this, this is, but how do I get me on? How do I get, how do I enlarge this thing? Maybe move farther away. I think if it turns. Well, yeah, but I, no, but I, I need to, um, Yeah, I'm trying to see. I have to see my screen. How do I see my screen? My uh, my <laughs> video feed. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. Here we go. Yeah, that's a good. All right. That's a good. It's a good shot. Yeah. All right. So you can <laughs> see that. Okay. Yep. The color sucks. I don't know. I guess it doesn't do well with fluorescent lighting, but that's okay. Uh, this is a, a helium neon laser. It's similar to the one in the kit. It's about a, one milliwatt. It's in a skinnier cylinder, but other than that, it's a very similar laser. You see the polarizing beam splitter cube in the center. The retroreflector is in the cylinder closer to me. And the two other cylindrical objects are quarter wave plates in fancy expensive housings. This system has a literal voice coil. It's actually a small a miniature woofer loudspeaker. And on that is mounted a mirror. So this one's set up for a mirror, not a, not a retro reflector. And back here is another Thor Labs mount with a planar mirror on it. The detector in this case is just a pair pair of photodiodes. You can see one, they're glowing red because of the laser beam. There's a uh, an angled plate that's acting as the beam splitter and attached directly to the photodiodes. One has a linear polarizer and the other has a circular polarizer act for use as a, with its water, quarter wave plate. And then I put the cover back on so the fluorescent light doesn't affect it too much. This particular system is pretty primitive. It doesn't have any fancy positioning except for a uh, micrometer stage, but it does have a little function generator that's generating a waveform, a triangle waveform with a period of about 10 seconds and a amplitude of the mirror of about one micrometer. And here's the display on the oscilloscope of the movement of the uh, mirror by the uh, voice coil. It's going back and forth. One, one rotation is about 158 nanometers. And if I just touch the floor, this is a massive breadboard on foam blocks on a massive workbench on a concrete floor. And I'm just, and I'm just walking on the floor and you can see it goes crazy. If I if I touch anything, if I touch the workbench, if I just tap on the just place my finger on the workbench, it 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 goes crazy. That is what you're up against when you have to minimize vibrations because the, the interferometer is extremely sensitive. We're talking about one rotation here is at one two hundredth roughly one four hundredth of the diameter of a human hair. So this whole thing needs to be very on a very stable surface. So when you guys are building these, this, you know, don't stick it on your kitchen table. Expect it to be, you get stable output. So I think that's about all I have to say. Um, 
anybody have any questions or comments? So you said uh, one rotation is 158. It's yeah, this one is the high stability. This is the high stability plane mirror interferometer, so it has double the resolution gotcha. of the uh, of the modified linear interferometer, which is what you'll be using. Mm -hmm. And the reason is that it uses plane mirrors instead of uh, cube corners. And when you use plane mirrors, the the light takes goes two times through the interferometer cube. The way mm -hmm. the path, way the way the quarter wave plates change the paths is that it ends up going through the the cube twice as long, twice as many times. So they're double the double the path length and double the sensitivity. Mm -hmm. It's just we we're using for the challenge. It's it's generally somewhat easier to align the cube cube corners compared to mirrors. So maybe that's one reason that that probably were used. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yep. Hey Sam, I have bad news for you. Yep. We're using kitchen tables for the competition. <laughs> You're using kitchen tables. Yeah. <laughs> well, all right. you'll, just have, you'll just have to remove the noise with the with the my Rio processing. <laughs> yeah, because people don't realize they build an interferometer. They don't realize when it, you're getting a really noisy signal that it's probably working correctly. When it's a signal is stable, you don't have any interference. The beams are not overlapping. People yeah. don't realize that. You're looking for a really unstable signal, then you know it's doing its job. Yeah. The rule is that you can use any damping treatment you like as long as it can be fully removed from the air apparatus. Does that yeah, make so sense? Bicycle inner tubes are acceptable. Whether how yeah. much they'll help, I don't know. But stuff like that, you can put underneath. Certainly, certainly you don't want it to be stuck right on the kitchen table surface. You yeah. definitely want some kind of isolation, which can be bubble wrap. Bubble wrap's probably not too bad. Many layers of bubble wrap. Also, anything that you do add should not cost come to a cost of greater than twenty bucks. I think was, was that more? Yeah. Well, uh, that, that leaves out any optic. Any, anything. Maybe fifty bucks. Exactly. Uh, if you want to add something, uh, reach out to the committee and we'll tell you if it, if it's okay to use it or not. Just well, for example, I don't know. If, I don't know if adding mirrors would be in, replacing the cube corners with mirrors would be. In, an interesting option for some if they if they get if they got done really early and they have nothing right. better to do get some yeah. planar mirrors and replace the uh, the cube corners and see how the resolution doubles yeah mm -hmm. it's, I mean, it's not that terrible to align so it it it, it is it may be worthwhile trying that the mirrors are not expensive i mean you can spend all you want to practice things but at the competition uh, uh use the equipment you are provided yeah. and on top of that uh, damping treatments are okay or anything uh, uh, that's less than 50 dollars uh, you can use it at the challenge and i don't know if it's, it's the option i'm i'm available to answer questions too by email uh, <laughs> Yeah. You can find contact form on my website, which which occasionally works correctly, or else through the uh, through the committee, or I can be, provide my email address. Yeah, I'll do that right now. Awesome. I think, I'm thinking you also sell those plane mirror interferometers too, right? Pardon me. You also sell those plane mirror interferometers too, right? Well, I, I sell these complete. I sell the system that I'm showing right here. If people really want to get into it, yeah, as well as. As well as displacement measuring systems using Hewlett Packard lasers and you know the whole whole nine yards. You you want to set up a foundry in your basement? Yeah, I can provide you with the interferometers. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, like the Zeeman kit, right? Like the mm -hmm. Zeeman kit. I mean, just you know, go to my uh, search Silicon Sam on uh, eBay. It's not Laser Sam because it this my eBay account was created in two years two thousand. I don't know. In Silicon Sam was his historical nickname I received, so it should probably be Laser Sam now. But it's, you can't change email, eBay uh, IDs too easily. So yeah, I, I sell all so, all sorts of all sorts of stuff related to this uh, these kinds of applications. 
Cool. And at very reasonable prices. Yeah, well, com yeah, compared <laughs> compared to real prices, yes, they're they you know yeah. you want to just get into this, you know, you're talking a few hundred bucks at most yeah. to just get into it. And it's well worth it if you real if you're really interested in exploring these kind of topics beyond what uh, what is in the uh, challenge, because the you know the challenge has kind of set some guide boundaries on what you can do because of the set the physical setup and so forth but uh, yeah anyway cool thanks a lot Sam. thank you thank you really That's appreciate it. It. all right we have 10 minutes of open forum right yeah i see some uh, questions or not on on the chat uh, i have one question um, Cyrus is, wants to build a, a late a, a diamond turning late, right? Uh, someone said they have a question. Who's that? Yes, this is Sumeda here. Uh, Hi. I, I want to just check with that uh, uh, little demo that was done. Uh, did the uh, did the signal on the oscilloscope change because of the vibrations? Both vibration and like uh, the, it was also like, moving. Like it was forcing the ground or something. Like it was hitting the ground and. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. I think there, Sam was clockwise and there was clockwise and a counterclockwise. Yeah, the uh, clockwise and counterclockwise was because the uh, you know the voice call was uh, moving the mirror back and forth. But on top okay. of that, uh, Sam was uh, walking around pretty heavily intentionally to show uh, how sensitive the interferometer can be. Okay. Right. Yeah. All right. No other questions. Maybe, maybe that question should be for Sam. Sam, uh, is this these lasers are two milliwatts or or they actually less than that? But oh uh, yeah. yeah, because they're yeah. The laser is uh, well, a spec on the laser is one milliwatt. It can be higher. So yeah, you know, I don't know what the question where the question is going, but if it's like, don't the stare into the beam with your remaining good eye, it's probably good advice. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's, this isn't going to blind you. These are not, these are, these are like wimpy laser pointer power. Mm -hmm. Or I should say like legal laser pointer power as opposed to what you can buy today, which are literally a uh, hundred, hundred times higher without realizing it. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If you unintentionally see it, it's not a problem because you'll move your eyes real quick. Yeah. It's, just, it's, it's like the sun. Basically it, you don't stare into the sun. It's the same idea. The power is similar. The power entering your eye is similar to what would be if you, if you looked at the sun. And of course, you're not, you know, most people don't try to do that uh, very often. But you'll, you might have after images. There may be some after images. They'll, they'll go away in a few minutes. So these are say these are, you know, they're not truly eye safe, but they're they're for all intents and purposes, they're they're not going to blind you. Mm -hmm. But again, about the, uh, you know, that black tube looks sturdy, but it's, it's a, it's a aluminum cylinder with a glass bottle inside. And that glass bottle can break if the thing is dropped. So please do not drop the black cylinder. The bottles in. That's what's in, inside oh, wow. the cylinder. <laughs> <laughs> they not, need to not drop any of this stuff. Don't drop any of this no, stuff. All right, don't drop <laughs> any of them. Especially the <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you drop, you drop the any of this yeah, stuff. You, you put drop, a thing you in. Drop them, drop, they'll drop your grade. That's what will happen. You drop. <laughs> yeah, no, no, don't be dropping nothing. You can drop. You can drop bad jokes. Yeah. <laughs> That's about it. This one. Well, I want to confess. I, I was the one that broke the laser. The first one we got. <laughs> I dropped it off my pocket. <laughs> <laughs> all right don't be a louise don't carry the laser in the pocket of your shorts that's, that's, that's all the advice we have yeah don't yeah. louise your laser <laughs> so kumar are the presentations yes. that you did gave and the one that sam gave available on a yes. central depository online for the students to access yeah these? Uh, oh, the YouTube video has got very detailed instructions of how you put it together yeah. and how you line all the optics up. 
So, you know, there's not time to do it here. Um, but the the video is, what, 12 minutes? So it's not a huge amount of time. Yeah, two, two, two 15 or 12 minute videos. And yeah, uh, I will share uh, these slides and uh, I'm going to split the uh, Zoom recorded video into two, Sam's tutorial and uh, the slides into two and also post it on YouTube. Also, I should note that uh, the couple of things that are very important when you set up the interferometer, one is that the beams from the laser and then when they're reflected back to the uh, PBS be absolutely parallel, that will very greatly simplify setting up and eventually you'll have to fine to that so they're perfectly parallel. The other thing is that the path length from the polarizing beam splitter to the two Retro reflectors should be maintained close, pretty close to one another. You know, within a, you know, within a centimeter or so that the of the range of the uh, of the challenge of uh, uh, movement objectives. So you can't have them two inches apart. That will that because of the laser not being a stabilized laser, that will do very strange things. So you want them within a you know a couple centimeters of each other. Equal path lengths. Yes. Yeah. Equal yeah, you know, not obviously they can't be exactly equal because one of the one of the reflectors is moving, but mm -hmm. keeping them relatively close together will greatly ease your frustration level. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. Any other questions? Yeah, then uh, I guess the challenge is on. Yeah. And great meeting everybody, uh, even if yeah. it is remotely. We look really look forward to seeing everyone in Boston. Tenth anniversary of the competition and in the same place as the first one. That's pretty sweet. And uh, 